Thank you. You've just heard about the anti-religious side of Darwinism. I'll speak briefly about uh, what we're often told is the scientific side of Darwinism. We often hear, for example, evolution is a fact. We also hear nothing in biology and medicine uh, makes sense except in the light of evolution. The problem with these aphorisms is that the word evolution is a slippery one. It has many meanings. For example, evolution in the hands of Darwinists who are promoting their theory can mean simply change over time. Yet, no sane person denies that the present is different from the past. So there's no quarrel there. But that's really the sugar coating on a very bitter pill. And the bitter pill is Darwin's theory of evolution. According to Darwin's theory, all living things are descended from a common ancestor by unguided natural processes such as random mutations and survival of the fittest. That's Darwin's theory in its original and modern form. Well, uh, in science, we judge theories by the evidence. What's the, the what's the evidence for Darwin's theory? First of all, common ancestry. If Darwin's theory is correct, then the history of life would look something like my hand, with the common ancestor down here at the wrist and various branches. In fact, Darwin himself called this the great tree of life. This branching tree pattern, we would expect to find in the fossil record, in molecular comparisons among living organisms that would trace them back to their uh, common ancestor. But what we find instead is that the fossil record does not have this pattern. Instead, the branching tree pattern is imposed on the fossil record and the data are shoehorned into this pattern to make it look like Darwin's theory works. The same is true for the molecular evidence. The second aspect of Darwin's theory, the mechanism of evolution, that is unguided natural processes such as random mutation and uh, survival of the fittest, uh, we can produce a lot of mutations in living things. We do it all the time in our laboratories. Far more uh, a variety, much more variety of mutations than we do find in nature. And yet, we can safely say that the vast majority of them are harmful. The rare mutations that are not harmful produce minor biochemical changes, such as in bacterial antibiotic resistance. The anatomical changes that we would expect to find from mutations that Darwin's theory needs never occur. Or I should say, when they do occur, they're invariably harmful or fatal. So I know as an embryologist, uh, I can do all kinds of things to a fruit fly embryo, mutated in every which way, and there's only three possible outcomes. A normal fruit fly, a defective fruit fly, or a dead fruit fly, and that's it. And we have decades, indeed more than a century of scientific experiments that show us this is true. How about selection? Well, selection, the, the record of experiments and selection goes back even further. In fact, for centuries, people have been doing selection in the barnyard. Plants and animals have been selected for many centuries, long before Darwin came along. And the uh, invariable uh, lesson that we get from this is that no matter how much we select plants and animals and other organisms, we do not produce new species. In all this time, and in all the 150 years since Darwin, no one has produced a new species by selecting variations. So the evidence for Darwin's theory is surprisingly thin. When it's called a fact, uh, whatever the fact is, it's not Darwin's theory itself. That is the common ancestry and unguided modification of organisms. Now the other aphorism was, uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Well, if we mean by evolution change over time, sure. I mean, nothing in the real world makes sense except in the light of change over time. But obviously the aphorism is intended to mean more than that. And when we look at Darwin's actual theory, we find that the history of biology and medicine owes practically nothing to Darwin's theory. First of all, most of the major disciplines in biology were founded by people, pioneers, scientists, who lived before Darwin. They never even heard of his theory. This is true of anatomy and physiology, botany and zoology, comparative anatomy, embryology, even the fields Darwinists now like to claim as their own, the study of fossils. That field was founded before Darwin by someone who uh, was a creationist. Uh, the field of genetics was founded by Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk, again, 
Uh, actually, he was contemporaneous with Darwin, but he rejected Darwin's theory. He saw his theory of genetics as an alternative to it. So these major disciplines in biology and medicine owe nothing to Darwin. In medicine itself, uh, we look at the great triumphs of medicine in the modern world. One of them would be, uh, it was mentioned a minute ago, that uh, Richard Dawkins thinks uh, religion is like smallpox, but harder to eradicate. Well, the fact is, smallpox has been eradicated. And this began with the work of Edward Jenner, who lived before Darwin was born, who found that by immunizing people with cowpox, a milder disease, he could prevent the spread of smallpox. And now, today, there is no smallpox in the world except in laboratory cultures. So one of the greatest triumphs of modern medicine owes absolutely nothing to Darwin's theory. And I could go down the list. Uh, one thing we're often told is that you couldn't understand, you can't understand bacterial antibiotic resistance without Darwinian evolution. The fact of the matter is, however, that the great pioneers in this field, uh, that is the discoverers of, say, penicillin and streptomycin, had no use for Darwin's theory. Uh, Ernst Chain, who uh, uh, won a Nobel Prize for purifying penicillin, specifically criticized Darwin's theory. So did Selman Waxman, who discovered streptomycin. Uh, in the modern uh, management of antibiotic res resistance in hospitals, physicians do not consult the origin of species. They isolate patients, a classical medical technique. They isolate a patient so that the, the bacterium doesn't spread. Uh, they try multiple approaches to eliminating the infection. And they search for new drugs using design, intelligence. They don't just randomly mutate things and then see what happens. They go looking using their minds, their intelligence. Uh, so antibiotic resistance, which is often touted as the greatest triumph of Darwinian medicine, actually owes nothing to Darwinism at all. So <clears throat> when it comes to the evidence and the fruitfulness of Darwinian theory, uh, the theory is, uh, to say the least, greatly overblown. Darwin Day is not really celebrating science or medicine. We don't have a Newton day. We don't have a Copernicus day. We don't have a Pasteur day. The only reason we have a Darwin day is because Darwinism is not based on good science. As John West just pointed out, it's really an anti-religious uh, propaganda tool in the hands of many. And this is why Darwin day has become a major uh, public relations campaign, which really has nothing to do with science. Thank you.